Hello, I'm Emma Stan, and the title of my paper is The Data Image, Thought as Currency in the Age of Datafication. This paper proposes a theory called the data image, which accounts for a specific mechanism or effect of datafication. So I summarized the theory, and towards the end, I attempt to resolve a methodological issue that needs to be worked out before I elaborate on and apply the framework. The data image draws from a series of concepts developed by Jean Deleuze, namely the movement image, the time image, and the image of thought, which he worked on with Felix Guattari. To understand the data image, it's necessary for me to review these ideas. And for the sake of time, this will be a very crude review that emphasizes the components which are most salient to my theory of the data image. The movement image and the time image were introduced into Deleuze's two-part series on cinema called Cinema One and Cinema Two. These books account for the ways that the art of cinema images flows of motion and time. Now I'm using image as a verb in the Deleuzean sense, which might also uh, be translated as capture, frame, depict, or represent. To image something in this sense is to put a frame around it that emphasizes certain parts. Uh, to further understand what Deleuze means by movement image and time image, we have to consider one of his major influences, Henri Bergson. Deleuze was especially interested in Bergson's research on the nature of multiplicity and difference, and specifically what multiplicity and difference mean for our understanding of time. Although the concept of multiplicity denotes numerability, meaning the capacity to be counted as more than one, for Bergson, the state of being multiple is ultimately qualitative rather than quantitative. He says that multiplicity is constituted by qualitative incommensurability or difference in kind as opposed to degree. So qualia are multiple when they cannot withstand equivocation through a common substrate. From this premise, digitized entities, meaning all products and functions of digital computation, cannot aspire to true multiplicity or difference because they are the same in kind. They are all qualitatively of the same substance, which is digital data. In his book, The Creative Mind, Bergson considers the concept of time from this perspective. He says that while time is normally understood as numerable, this is an illusion and that time is instead a process by which qualia differentiate and self-actualize as unique instances of pure time, or what he calls duration as duration. And he says that when we, uh, when we measure time, quote, we never deal with duration as duration. What is counted is only a certain number of extremities of intervals or moments, uh, in short, virtual halts in time. To state that an incident will occur at the end of a certain time t is simply to say that one will have counted from now until then a number t of simultaneities of a certain kind. So in the movement image, Deleuze uses Bergson's theory of difference to discuss intervals between movements. He writes that, quote, even at the level of the most elementary living being, one would have to imagine micro intervals smaller and smaller intervals between more and more rapid movements. And he goes to the dawn of evolution, adding that, quote, biologists speak of primeval soup, which made living beings possible. It is here that outlines of axes appear. And these axes give orientation to manifest phenomena. Quote, a left and a right, a high and a low, one should therefore conceive of micro intervals, even in the primeval soup. It is here that the first outlines of solids or rigid and geometric bodies would be formed. Finally, as Bergson was to say, the same evolution which organizes matter into solids will organize the image in more and more elaborate perception, which has solids as its objects. 
So Deleuze, as you can see in the top point, predates the digital turn. And even though Deleuze's, um, I'm sorry, Bergson predates the digital turn. And although Deleuze's career stretched into the 1990s, uh, most of his work didn't consider digital computing directly, but he still frequently cited in digital media studies, maybe because digitization is a process in this evolutionary trajectory. One might say that digitization uh, structures and frames our perceptions. Put differently, there may be a mode of perception proper to the digital. Deleuze goes on to explain that the sensing of any particular thing is always related to another image which frames and only retains one part of it. The movement image is that which frames our apprehension of movement. So it's an image of movement, or perhaps more correctly, an image for movement, an image which envelops our perception of movement. So too with the time image and the way we perceive time. And there isn't just one type of time image or movement image. Deleuze names multiple types and leaves open the possibility that there are endless others. Now in the visual medium of cinema, we might think of images in the conventional sense, meaning pictures. Images relate to the faculty of sight and the organ of the eye. But what Deleuze means by image doesn't necessarily correspond to one sense or another. In a publication co-authored with Gadari, he describes a concept called the image of thought, which is a predicate for thinking. The image of thought itself cannot be thought. Um, to quote them directly, it is the image thought gives itself of what it means to think, uh, what it means to make use of thought, to find one's bearings in thought. So it includes whatever you normally understand thinking to be, but might also include sensory perception, dreaming, feeling, um, all activities which constitute mentality and subjective experience. They emphasize that there are as many images of thought as there are modes of thinking and conceptualizing. In Descartes, they write, it is a matter of a subjective understanding implicitly presupposed by the I think as first concept, the cogito. In Plato, it's the virtual image of an already thought that doubles every actual concept, whereas Heidegger invokes a pre-ontological understanding of being. And because it engulfs everything thinkable, the image of thought appears to us as infinite. It is virtually infinite, and that's a, a key point. So the original title for this paper was the data image of thought, because what I'm proposing is that data, specifically digitally computable data, constitute an image of thought. In other words, I'm saying that data define thought, or they may define thought. Deleuze and Guattari write that the image of thought constitutes what they call a plane of imminence, and the plane of imminence can be structured in various ways. I am claiming that data structure a plane of imminence in accordance with the empirical attributes of digital computability. In order to be computable, data must be discrete and finite. So data determine that their plane of imminence is laid out, to use Deleuze and Guattari's word, in conformity with their own structural finitude and irreducibility. The data image delimits thought in complicity with the technical structure of data while sustaining paradoxically the image or appearance of the infinite. In other words, it imposes a structure and a boundary on thought while sustaining the notion of thought's limitlessness. The idea of virtual infinity or the appearance of infinity is where we'll draw in capitalism. Today, data is capital, and by that I mean it's an exemplary form of currency. We're in the age of ubiquitous datification, and to uh, separate the term datification from digitization 
I'll use the distinction made by uh, the scholars Meyer Schoenberger and Zukir. So if digitization simply means rendering content or phenomena, any phenomena in digital formats, uh, datification emphasizes that translation into digital formats means discretization or rendering into discrete components from which they accommodate computation and importantly, quantification for the purposes of tabulation and analysis. This tabulation permits objects to be standardized and equivocated as financial value or currency. Um, so I have that point up on the screen. Sorry about the delayed appearance there. Uh, once something is digitized, it can then be datafied or subject to standard formatting, as in an Excel spreadsheet or any number of schematics for data. And today, data are highly valuable economic commodities. Digitization quickly slips into datification. Now, by the principles of capitalism, value needs to constantly grow, even though resources are finite. The things we actually want to buy with money are not immediately replenishable. Food, water, and most resources have some sort of material limit. That is, until we get to the age of datification, where data become very valuable. At this point, um, most of our online activities are susceptible to commodification. And aside from what we do with our data and how we share it through networks where other par parties may assign value to it, um, software, data models, websites, uh, all digital objects, um, are vulnerable to this process of commodification, but their value is detached from material finitude. So whereas three-dimensional items are often assigned a certain cost in relation to their uh, potential scarcity or the value it, or um, the input, the material and labor input it takes to produce them, it costs virtually nothing to produce data, to copy data. Um, data may be immediately copied and theoretically accrued ad infinitum. Now there are environmental costs of computing, but right now the direct relationship between environmental costs and financial cost um, is so neg negligible that it doesn't have real implications for this theory. Perhaps it should, uh, but that's a different conversation. So data are what economists call non-rivalrous goods. They are immediately replenishable. They can be copied and processed over and over again without their value diminishing. They are perfect for the endless accumulation of capital. And when an image of thought determines that the capacities of thought mirror the structure and function of data, Thinking more readily accommodates datification. And when thought generates value for those who own the means of datification, it might become a form of labor. Thus, the data image may be an instrument of psychopolitics. And the term psychopolitics comes from uh, Bernard Stiegler, who used it to describe the effects of uh, mental activities, the, uh, the political effects of mental activities specifically. Uh, he intends the term to supplement Michel Foucault's biopolitics, which indicates that there is a political function to the optimization of health under capitalism. So philosophical accounts of psychopolitics explain how mental activities are subsumed by and operate in the service of capitalism. Uh, it's the title of a book by the philosopher Byung-Chul Han. And despite the good intentions in my abstract, I can't do full justice to the theory of psychopolitics for the sake of time, but I'll instead move along to indicate the methodological point of tension that I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation. Although their work is different, 
Foucault, Stiegler, and Hahn are all critical of the function of the sci sciences, such as psychology and psychiatry. And they argue that the sci sciences um, make certain normative perspectives on mentality appear to be natural and non ideological, and that this appearance dis uh, disguises the true function of the sci sciences, which is to produce ideal, productive capitalist subjects by constructing certain norms of mental health that accommodate capitalist political economy. And this perspective was uh, originally proposed by Michel Foucault. It's been taken up by a number of other scholars. The tension, however, is that in describing psychopolitical functions, one has to make normative claims about the mind, which, if not proven by scientists, are at least scientized insofar as they assume truths about how the mind works. So critical theorists and continental philosophers are famously suspicious towards assumptions such as these. Now, to describe the operations of the data image, you might say that it operates at the subliminal or pre-reflexive level. Um, the term pre-reflexive has been used by a number of scholars writing in this vein. Um, these include Sun Ha Hong, Franco Bifo Berardi, Jan Mulier Butong, and Mackenzie Wark, among several others. I'm not going to read this quote from Stiegler verbatim. It um, has to do with how digital media help us exteriorize memory and how they change our approach to knowledge. But I put it up here because it's a good example of this scientized approach to uh, political accounts of the mind that I think are interesting in light of this uh, Foucauldian influence that is uh, very much also in this world that Stiegler and these other scholars are in where scientized accounts of the mind are putatively um, not what we should be advancing, but we seem to have to advance them to describe uh, this new political mechanism of psychopolitics nevertheless. So it might be argued that the claim that Stiegler is making here um, that memory and knowledge have neurobiological substrates is reductive or materialist. Um, but I would counter that that hypothetical critique of Stiegler is Cartesian and that what he's getting is at is that the mind um, is not a physical or material substance, but that in the age of media and in accordance with the concept of the plane of imminence, materiality and virtuality, um, physical embodiment and the image or appearance of a thing, which is what I mean by virtuality, that those two domains are one and the same. The material and the virtual are fused. Uh, a similar observation has been made by the philosopher Eugene Thacker in his book, The Global Genome where he argues that the aim of the biotech industry is to define biology as information, while at the same time asserting the materiality of biology. Um, so biotechnology, it models, uh, sorry, I'm gonna go back for a sec. Biotechnological processes model biological compounds and digital substrates. Information technologies digitize and datafy the activities of our mind. Uh, so they assert the materiality of our thinking, which permits the reification of thought through the medium of data, but they also sustain this idea that thinking is purely virtual. So they fuse the virtual and the material aspects of thought. And I, I'm arguing that this fusion yields an image of thought which um, is faithful to digitality. Um, we are thinking in the resolution of digitality. 
So we have to break the Cartesian grip to understand the data image as a psychopolitical function, but this doesn't require us to accept scientized models of mental phenomena and the normative claims to which they give rise, such as uh, claims regarding the biomedical model of mental illness or intellectual disability. We are not speaking of relative fidelity to an original truth about the mind, which is beyond social construction, but advancing a competing articulation which influences our conceptions of mental phenomena. In other words, we can acknowledge that the assumed truths about the mind, which are necessary to fully theorize the data image, are not independent of our own construction. They're rhetorically constructed in accordance uh, with the premise that everything that is scientific is a construct. Scientific principles and mechanisms do not exist out there in, in the world any more than digital media view. So the data image emphasizes that the politics of mind and the science of mind are one and the same, uh, but that their manifest forms and effects aren't inevitable. Uh, we might consider this a counter biopolitics of criticism, where we deploy the power of scientific explanation while reflexively acknowledging that um, we are constructing norms in order to provide an adequate explanation for this mechanism. Um, and at this level of image construction or perception framing, when we're talking about images of thought, there's no way to express the mechanics of power without deploying the same kind of power. The difference is in the recognition that these truths are not independent of our making and that this is not being done in the name of objective science, but towards a deliberate political purpose. So um, that's what I have. And thank you for listening.